So social justice has become a term which is in everybody's mouth today, but it is hardly ever defined. The term appears to widely shared feelings and intuitions concerning justice and therefore seems to be self-explaining. Such feelings mostly refer to different kinds of inequality, which are perceived as unjust. In my opinion, these feelings and intuitions are not just vain or lacking any sound basis. I do not want either to simply identify them with sentiments of envy, even though in many cases, envy certainly plays a role. However, I think that the success of social justice talk originates in a moral intuition which is to be taken seriously. The sound moral intuitions underlying claims to social justice are, however, mostly misguided by ignorance concerning the real causes of wealth and economic growth, as well as about basic facts of economics, like the fact of the scarcity of resources, we have heard about that this morning, and the role of capital accumulation, especially its decisive importance for technological innovation and the rise in productivity and general prosperity. These moral intuitions are moreover misguided by a misapprehension of the limited reach of human knowledge and of the nature of and importance of markets to overcome these limitations, as well as by myths concerning economic history, especially a sometimes far-reaching misreading of the history of capitalism. Social justice is commonly conceived as justice of distribution or as it is traditionally called, distributive justice. According to tradition, distributive justice is to be distinguished from commutative justice. The justice of relations between individual human beings, for example, in buying and selling and every kind of contracts. Distributive justice, justice is the justice in dealings of superior communities or authorities, namely the state, with the single persons posited under their authority or command. Distributive justice refers to the just distribution of burdens, for example taxation, and of benefits, not only material but also immaterial, like, for example, honors, distinctions, orders. As is well known, one of the fiercest and most influential critics of the concept of social justice was, has been was Friedrich August von Hayek. Also Hayek, he called it the marriage of social justice. Also Hayek follows the common usage of understanding social justice simply as distributive justice. This narrowing of the perspective prevents Hayek from taking into account other possible meanings of social justice, which, as we will see, are fully compatible with his critique of social justice as distributive justice and with his views on the market. Next slide. In the following, I will first expose Hayek's critique of social justice, focusing on its merits but also its limitations. That's it. These limitations will lead us in a second step to a set of questions ignored by Hayek and other libertarian critics of social justice and to a widening of the perspective. Thirdly, I will elaborate a higher order concept of social justice, justifying our most authentic moral intuitions about justice and compat compatible with both anthropological principles of Catholic social doctrine and Hayek's position. Finally, if time will be, I will examine how such an outlook can be integrated into Catholic social do doctrine. So uh, the first point, mm, now you are yeah, still here first, but Hayek's critique of social justice uh, or criticism of social justice. For Hayek, it is, a crucial, it is crucial to understand societies, markets, and the legal system in which markets are embedded as spontaneous orders. According to Hayek, spontaneous orders have to be distinguished from orders which are dis designed intentionally for a determinate purpose, something typical for organizations. Societies, market economies, and legal systems which contain a great multitude of individuals 
with diverging preferences and therefore pursuing different ends, are not established like organizations, but arise as the result of, evolution, of evolutionary processes which are not intentionally designed for a determined end. Free market economies develop as spontaneous, as develop as spontaneous orders too. They are the proper economic order, according to Hayek, of a free society. Its outcomes are not organized, planned, or otherwise guided by any intentional design. Therefore, and this is Hayek's main point, the distributional outcomes of markets can be called neither just nor unjust. Only human conduct can be called, called just or unjust. Therefore, Hayek affirms, in a free society, in which the position of the different individuals and groups is not the result of anybody's design, the difference in reward simply cannot meaningfully be described as just or unjust. End of the quotation. The market does not act with a single intention or purpose. It is not itself an actor. Therefore, the moral specification of just and unjust cannot be applied to its distributional results. Provided we abhor a commanded economy of socialism and a totalitarian political system and we understand that the market economy is a system in which each is allowed to use his knowledge for his own purposes, that is, the economic order of a free society, then the concept of social justice is necessarily empty and meaningless because in it nobody's will can determine the relative incomes of the different people or prevent that they be partly dependent on accident. End of the quotation. However, Hayek recognizes the following, quote, if we apply, apply the terms, hmm, the next, if we apply the terms just or unjust to a state of affairs, they have meaning only in so far as we hold someone responsible for bringing it about or allowing it to come about. This statement has far-reaching consequences, as we will see. Hayek repeats the point two pages later, quote, since only situations which have been created by human will can be called just or unjust, the particulars of a spontaneous order cannot be just or unjust. If it is not, provided it is not the intended or foreseen result of somebody's action, this cannot be called just or unjust. Markets certainly are spontaneous orders, not only in the way they have evolved over time, but also in the way they work at any given time. However, they always produce their outcomes in the context of a given legal and institutional framework for whose continuing existence, hmm? that's okay, hmm? for whose continuing consistence, um, existence, um, de determinate persons actually are responsible. Determinate legal and institutional arrangements, as well as a particular property distribution, may very well lead to, sponta to the spontaneous order of the market to produce distributional results for example, inequalities or disadvantages and discriminations for determined people or groups of people which under different legal and institutional presuppositions would not have been produced this way. For example, if a legal order discriminates against determinate social, social ethnic or religious groups, depriving them from the possibility of ex exercising those jobs which are the most rewarding economically rewarding in terms of income and social prestige and or impeding them from acquiring property rights, for example, by an excessive and corrupt state bureaucracy, then the social and economic distributional pattern result resulting from the spontaneous order of the market operating under such premises will certainly reflect these initial discriminations too and thus the injustice of the initial configuration of the legal order and the institutions in which market activities are embedded. Applying the Hayekian understanding 
of justice as a property of intentional human acts, the conclusion is the following. The distributional outcomes of market processes and the state of affairs created by them can be called unjust and therefore cause a claim in the name of justice to being corrected exactly in so far the categories of just and unjust can be applied to the legal and institutional presuppositions shaping market outcomes as well as to the persons responsible for the structure of these presuppositions. So I come now to the second point, the limits of Hayek's critique of social justice and the widening of the perspective. So next slide. Yeah. No, it's not yet, but no, it's the fifth. Yeah, it's okay. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Um, Yeah, it's still this way. It's good. It is astonishing that Hayek refrains from further analysis of the possible implications of his above mentioned statement. I repeat it. Situations which have been created by human will can be called just or unjust. In my view, but the market as such has no will. It does not, here, here is right. But everything what is created intentionally by human will can be called just or unjust. Hmm? In my view, this, despite the essential soundness of his argument against social justice, reveals clearly a limitation of his approach. Assuming, therefore, with Hayek, that the distributional outcomes of market processes as such cannot be evaluated according to criteria of justice, we still might evaluate these outcomes and the state of affairs created by them on the basis of other, higher or independent criteria which, moreover, are not criteria of distributional justice, that's the main point, but much more fundamental and actually apply to the legal and institutional framework of society. In order to make out what such criteria of justice might be, I want to recall the classic definition of justice by the great Roman jurist Ulpian. In, in Latin and in English as it is transmitted through the medieval legal and philosophical tradition, especially Thomas Aquinas, it is also spuriously referred to by Hayek. He quotes it two, twice, I think, but rather in the notes then. The definition reads, justitia est constans et perpetua voluntas jus suum cuique tribuendi. Justice is the constant and perpetual will to render to every man his due, his due. Hmm? Use suum, his due, his right, his use. Suum. This is also the, the, the definition of the virtue of justice Aquinas uses. Once we adopt this classic definition of justice, the question arises whether there is a due, a use, that is a right, something owned to people, owed, uh, due to people, which human persons as members of society possess before they are participants in market processes. And independent of their social and economic position, rights they possess qua being human, and therefore do not belong to distributional justice, but to what is due to their being human persons. I think the entire Judeo-Christian and subsequent European and theological, philosophical, juridical and political tradition, as we have seen in the movie yesterday evening, is in different degrees based on this idea. There exists a point of reference of justice, which is human nature. Human beings created in the image of God as free and self-responsible being, beings called to active participation by their proper work, creativity and incentives in shaping the world. Most importantly, this initial calling of men must not be impeded or frustrated by the legal and institutional framework of society. For this would mean to withhold from human beings what is due to them, what is their right as human beings, and would thus clearly be a violation of justice. From this derives, not of distributional justice, eh, of just its justice as in its most fundamental sense. From this derives the idea of human rights in their most fundamental meaning, not as necessary legal rights and claims 
to the state and certainly not as a claim towards a determinate, determined share in wealth and opportunities, social rights, hmm? but as a moral claim to be treated as equal qua human being and correspondingly a claim of justice. Human rights are something due, a use which to counteract or despise is unjust. In order not to be trapped now by the concept of social justice as rightly rejected by Hayek, I say rightly rejected by Hayek, we have to assert from the existence of such rights cannot be deduced that determinate market outcomes are violating these rights and are therefore unjust. That's correct in Hayek's critique. It is the same as with the death of people, it's now a, I make an analogy, the death of people by an earthquake. We cannot say an earthquake an earthquake's killing of people is unjust because earthquakes do not bring this about intentionally. They are not intentional agents. It is just a natural event. We could, however, qualify the killing of these peoples as unjust insofar as it is the consequence of culpable and intentional neglect of those responsible for having fraudulently built poorly designed houses unable to resist a foreseeable earthquake. That, it, that happens. Hmm? Analogously, neither the mere fact of inequality as caused by market processes nor the facts of poverty or lack of opportunity as such or similar states of affairs can be considered unjust. It's like consequence of an earthquake. It's not natural, event. it's not an intentional agent, the market. So far, Hayek is right. Not right he is when denying from the outset that there is no possible perspective in which market outcomes can be called unjust. As the killing of people by an earthquake could be the consequence of an injustice and therefore, to that extent, be intentional and called unjust. Consider the case mentioned earlier that the legal and, inju and institutional framework of a determinate market economy is intentionally designed to systematically counteract the rights of human beings, qua human beings, and with this the basic requirements of justice. The intentional character of this kind of injustice is given even if only by omission, for example, by not interfering instead of abolishing a discriminatory framework, such counteraction of rights takes place take the case of slavery. In this case, it's not the, the outcome of slavery is not the fault of the market, of the slavery market, it's the, the discrimination which gave rise to the slavery market, hmm? which is the injustice. Yeah. In this case, and applying high criteria of intentionality, the distortions of market outcomes that necessarily follow are to be considered as intentionally caused. Therefore, and in so far, they contradict the valid principle of justice. They can be called unjust, called as they reflect the injustice of the framework. So with this, we have to, two levels of justice to be distinguished. Now the next. Hmm? Level one, the anthropological foundational level, human rights, the corresponding legal and institutional framework of society. Human beings are equal qua human beings with regard to human nature, and as such possess what we call human dignity. They have a claim towards their neighbors uh, to be respected in their dignity. We can call these rights natural rights or human rights. Regarding the economic life, these rights include man's right as free and self-responsible being to actively participate in shaping the world by means of his own work, its creativity and inventiveness, and with this the right to get with one's work a fair share to serve its own needs. Not to get a fair share by the state, but by his own work. Hmm? Counteracting these rights is a violation of justice, to impede somebody to work hmm, and to behave in this way like a human being is, is unjust. Intentionally violating them by means of the general configuration of the legal and institutional framework of society is opposed to what we can call social justice. Hmm. In that sense, because it refers to the whole setting up of society. Hmm. Next, hmm, level two. The level of the catalactic game of the market, as Hayek calls it. As such, the outcome of market processes can be qualified neither just, just nor as unjust, yet due to the initial configuration of the legal 
and institutional framework, these outcomes can be labeled as unjust. Not so because the market is unjust, the market, but because the initial configuration that shapes the market's distributional outcome violates justice by transmitting the initial injustice into distorted market outcomes. Distorted not by fault of the market, but by fault of the, of the, in, the, the initial framework. This presupposes that even if we conceive the legal and institutional framework of a market as itself being an order which has evolved spontaneously during history, such an evolution does not exclude human responsibility for the concrete shaping of this order and thus indirectly the distributional outcomes of market processes. Now, um, someone could object hmm, that putting so much emphasis on human responsibility for shaping the legal and institutional framework of a market economy contradicts Hayek's concept that legal orders and societies are spontaneous orders. Yet that there is no such contradiction can easily be shown on Hayekian grounds. Well, I'll do that now. Remember that according to Hayek, the spontaneous order of the evolution of civilization, society, the legal system and the market economy, they are not designed intentionally once and set up there have evolved hmm? Hmm? Uh, is not this, this is not the spont this evolution is not a spontaneity of blind or deterministic natural processes but always shaped also by intentionally acting human beings by governments lawyers legislators whose acts are part of the evolutionary process of such orders and for this reason can do better or worse. Therefore, regarding the evolution of the legal order, Hayek writes the following. The spontaneous process of growth may lead into an impasse from which it cannot extricate itself by its own forces or which it will at least not correct quickly enough. So, a real change in the law, in the law is required. And, next, uh, we have that already. The necessity, very good, the necessity, thank you, the ne necessity of such radical changes, radical changes of particular rules may be due to various causes, as that someone, some, that some past development was based on error or that it produced consequences later recognized as unjust. That's all part of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, spontaneous, the evolution of the spontaneous order. Hmm? According to Hayek, the most frequent cause of the necessity of such radical change, changes in the legal framework, is that the development of the law has lain in the hands of members of pa pa a particular class whose traditional views made them regard as just but could not meet the more general requirements of justice. So Hayek has a clear concept of a, what is a general requirement of justice. Hmm? He continues. Hmm? Next. No, oh, that's 10. That's okay. There can be no doubt, hmm? there can be no doubt that in such fields as the law of relations between master and servant, landlord and tenant, creditor and debtor, and in modern times between organized business and its customers, the rules have been shaped largely by the views of one of the parties and their particular interests. That's not the Marxist who's writing, it's Hayek. Hmm? It's surprising. These statements demonstrate that Hayek's idea of spontaneous orders allows, even requires, raising the question of justice regarding precisely those aspects of the economy, the economy in which intentional human acts and corresponding responsibility is involved. And this is the level of uh, the legal and institutional presuppositions, the rules on which markets are based and work. Therefore, the criteria of justice applying to the for framing of these legal rules and institutional presuppositions also indirectly apply to the outcomes of market processes as far as they are shaped, indirectly, as far as they are shaped, possibly distorted, by these legal and institutional presuppositions. Hmm? Uh, in fact, it was just the example you gave me before. Hmm? 
the energy markets and the raw materials markets which are in the hands of corrupt regimes in, and then captured by big international companies and exploited uh, in a way which, uh, uh, yeah, hmm? but there, the whole framework is, is distorted. So market outcomes will also be distorted. They will, hmm? but it's not, it's not the fault of the market, but of the initial framework. Hmm? Or another example here, if it corresponds with human dignity to make a living out of one's own work and thereby to acquire through pro property rights a fair share in the goods of this earth. Now, no market process causing winners and losers can be held morally responsible for the inequality caused by this process. So, because there are more talented people, there are people who are more, uh, perhaps they start in a better condition or they are more, uh, they work more and more harder and so on. Mm, they are more inventive, mm, creative. So categories of justice cannot be applied to them. Also to be lucky or not unlucky, it's not a question of just or unjust. Some people are just lucky, others are unlucky. Happens, but it's not unjust. However, a market process shaped by a discriminatory legal and institutional framework, which leads to the exclusion of a determinate group of people from work, keeps them in a state of inescapable poverty and without chance of becoming property owners and this is a distorted market process, distorted by the initial injustice of the legal and institutional framework of society. This happens in many countries, in, the, in Latin America and Africa. Again, it is not the market process itself which can be regarded as unjust. Its outcome reflects an injustice that is situated on a more fundamental level and has been culpably caused or allowed to continue existing, and this intentionally by human beings. The principles on which an evaluation of these outcomes be based, can be based are not principles of distributional justice situated on the level of the distributional outcomes of market processes. They rather belong to a higher or more fundamental sphere of principles which refer to human dignity. A sphere in which all human beings are equal. This is the sphere of equality of all human persons, qua human beings, and the corresponding due or right which is the proper object of the virtue of justice. Now, these considerations lead us now, lead us now our inquiry into the true meaning of social justice to the following step. Assuming there is no alternative to the market as the most efficient way for the allocation of resources, and that the market economy is the only economic order compatible with a free society, I presuppose that, the question arises, which are the criteria of justice for the legal and institutional framework of a market economy? And to this question we will now turn. Now in, so the social justice of capitalism and of the free market economy. In 1971, the famous American philosopher John Rawls published a book with the title, A Theory of Justice. This book has changed not only the academic but also the public discourse on social justice. Rawls conceives justice basically as fairness. Justice as fairness means that what justice refers to are the rules, the institutional configurations and procedures which determine socially relevant outcomes. Justice as fairness is based on the assumption that a society is a cooperative venture advantages for all citizens and must therefore be organized in a way which allows everyone to get a fair share in wealth, position, education, social esteem, etc., regardless of his initial position in society. Rawls' theory, theory of justice as fairness, is complex and sophisticated. It thus, um, well, Rawls is a liberal in the American sense, so he's a, of the left, he's a social democrat, we would say, in the European terms. According to the difference principle, no, the Rawls theory of the, well, excuse me, um, uh, well, it's, a co it's, a, it's, a, it's a sophisticated theory. I only re refer to one of its features, the so-called difference principle. According to the difference principle, inequalities are justified only to the extent that they are advantages also for the less well-off in terms of wealth and opportunities, and also in terms of access to public offices and esteem and so on. According to Rawls, the basic device to meet the difference principle is a progressive tax system and therefore a redistribution of income and property. Hmm? Typical mainstream view in a way. Hmm? As the American libertarian political scientist and philosopher John Tomasi 
argues in his book, Free Market Fairness, Rawls' theory of justice and particularly the difference principle is based on the sound assumption that hmm, an economic hmm, system should be advantageous for everybody. If not, it is unfair. He calls this the distributional adequacy condition. Hmm? An economic order that as such and on principle undermines the position of the most disadvantaged, that creates wealth and inequality at the expense of the last advantaged and generally of those who are less well off would not meet the distributional adequacy condition and therefore be unfair and unjust. Tomasi shows that for classical liberals from Locke, Wagner Smith, James Madison, Herbert Spencer, Ludwig von Mises, Ayn Rand, to Milton Friedman and even Murray Rothbard, or politicians like Ronald Reagan, the assumption that capital, capitalism and the free market economy are most profitable for everybody, including the poor, was always a decisive rationale for their moral justifi justification. They were all convinced of that. Hmm? Nobody of these li classic liberal or libertarian thinker thinks that it damages the poor and, well, who cares? Hmm? According to Tomasi, Hayek is no exception. Here Tomasi argues that a Hayekian view better fulfills the criterion of the distributional adequacy condition than Rawls' theory of justice. That's the important point. Let us therefore, at least for reasons of argument, hmm, assume that on a most abstract level, Rawls' difference principle is correct. That is, let us assume that the initial legal and institutional configuration of the economic order must be such that existing or growing inequality is advantageous for all also for the poorest social groups, and that a framing of the basic structures of this kind corresponds to justice so that the outcomes of market processes, whatever they are, shaped by it, cannot be called unjust or to be corrected in the name of justice. I have mentioned Rawls' contention that the distributional adequacy condition, the difference principle, is best met in property owning democracy in which incomes are redistributed by a progressive tax system, even if redistribution implies the slowing down of economic growth. Rawls admits that, hmm? but we, we have to redistribute despite of that because so we help the poor, hmm? even if we have less economic growth. Hmm? No. Now, another political philosopher, Jason Brennan, also referred to by Tomasi, has shown that this position is self-defeating. Rawls' position is self-defeating. Brennan calls this Rawls' paradox. It's an article, he has written an article uh, with this title. You can already change the, you know, yeah, here we have it. Hmm? It's a very good, a very good article. Hmm? If somebody's interested in it, they can send it to me. I have it in, uh, as a PDF. The paradox is that the requirements, you cannot download it on the internet, you have to pay for it. So I have, from the university, I could download I don't know whether it's legal or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm? ah, it's like a photocopy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's a very interesting, a very good article. Mm? The paradox is that the requirements of the difference principle and thus of the distributional adequacy condition are far better met in a society with a complex, completely free market that completely abstains from redistributionist policies and instead gives absolute priority to economic efficiency that is the capitalist dynamics of economic growth. If this, however, were the case, applying roles is different principle to such a society would also have to be called more just, even socially just. Brennan proves his, uh, this both in abstract and empirically. The abstract or theoretical argument runs as follows. Um, yeah, 12, yeah, still 12. Imagine, he says, imagine there are two societies, Pareto Superior Land and Fairness Land. It's not important now why he calls it Pareto Superior, it has to do with Pareto Optimality. It's, it's, mm. And Fairness Land. Fairness Land is Rawls Land. Mm. Fairness Land. Mm. Pareto Superior, superior Land in some, is some sort of capitalist society divided roughly into three equally sized classes with an income distribution of 10, 20, and 40. 
income units from its bottom to upper class, hmm? 10, 20, and 40. Fairness land initially is a mirror image of Pareto superior land. You will see the figures after it's projected. Hmm? With the same resources, human capital and distribution of wealth. However, fairness landers become convinced by reading Rawls's book and thus introduce a basic structure that aims to satisfy justice as fairness in Rawls' sense. Hmm? They determine, using immaculate counterfactual forecasting not yet available to our world's economists, that the difference principle is satisfied when the following distribution obtains, 15, 19, and 24. Hmm? Thus, at the moment that fairness land becomes a property-owning democracy, the poorest individuals in it are 50% wealthier than the poorest in Pareto Superior by redistribution transfers. Hmm? Since Pareto Superior land, as Rawls claims, focuses on economic efficiency, its economy grows faster than fairness lands. Fairness land works continually to maintain the 15, 19, 25 pattern. Hmm? But since this work requires that its government interfere with the market's spontaneous allocations of resources, it retards growth. Such interference entails interrupting the information, incentive, and learning structure of the market, thus disrupting the operation of the equilibrium principles that generate efficiency and growth. Rawls has granted us all of this. These are his premises. Now, what is the result? Now you see. Table one maps the growth of the two economies. Suppose Pareto Superior grows at 4% a year, while Fairness Land grows at 2%. Yes, slower growth because they make redistribution. Hmm? And uh, Rawls admits that. Hmm? Pareto Superior Land does not directly try to maximize the well being of the worst off. For sim simplicity, let us stipulate that the real incomes of each class grow at the same rate 4% for Pareto Superior Landers, 2% for Fairness Landers. Though, of course, realistic income growth rates are much more dynamic. Hmm? However, we have every reason to hold that the poor in Pareto Superior Land will have higher growth rates than the poor in Fairness Land. No one realistically believes that under normal conditions only the rich benefit from growth. Besides, the premise that growth is needed to benefit the poor is Rawls' own. Let us start at the year 1900 and see how the economies do over time. Now, the outcome is clear. After 100 years, in Pareto super Superior Land, the poorest are 50 times richer than in the beginning, while in Fairness Land, they are only seven times richer. And most important, without any redistribution, after 100 years, the poorest in Pareto Superior Land are about, about 50 times wealthier than the poorest in Fairness Land. The bad news is that while in Fairness Land the inequality ratio of the richest to the poorest has decreased, it has remained exactly the same in Pareto Superior Land. However, while in 1900 the richest people in Pareto Superior Land were less than double as rich than the richest in Fairness Land, after 100 years the poorest in Pareto Superior Land are about 12 times richer than their ancestors. Mm, see? The poor. And, um, and the middle class about seven times richer as the starting middle class. Notice also that the poorest people in Pareto superior land hmm, over a period of only one generation, more, one generation, more than double their wealth, while in fairness land they do not achieve to even doubling it. Hmm. Brennan not only argues on the basis of this abstract model, but proves his point also empirically. It's empirical data. He admits, quote, I cert it certainly is true that growth does not guarantee a benefit to the poor. It is even compatible with harming them. However, historically, when growth harms the poor, it does not guarantee a benefit. It can harm. But historically, when growth harms the poor, it is usually because property rights regimes and the rule of law are not in place. End of quote. That's the main point. 
and that can also be proven empirically. This precisely refers to the initial configuration of the legal and institutional framework of an economy on which discourses about social justice should be focused. Cultural factors, too, may play a role in making market outcomes harm the poorest, like the Indian caste system, for example. But such factors might also be described, at least according to Western standards, as a deficient property right regime and the rule of law, and a, a deficient rule of law, uh, uh, or rule of law including great injustice. The conclusion is, in the long run, from a strictly economic point of view and presupposing a just initial legal and institutional configuration that includes the rule of law and guarantees property rights for all without discrimination, the increase of inequality due to capital accumulation is much more effective in enriching the poor than redistribution. That's the point. You got that? Or shall I repeat it? I repeat it. Hmm? From a strict economic point of view and presupposing an a just initial legal and institutional configuration that includes the rule of law and guarantees property rights for all without discrimination, the increase of inequality due to capital accumulation is much more effective, effective in enriching the poor than redistribution. This inequality, in that case, enriches the poor. It's the cause for enrichment of the poor. So according to the difference principle, it is also more just, especially when focusing on future generations. Social justice seems to be on the side of an unfettered free market economy and against any kind of redistribution which the aim of reducing inequality. If we look at society not only at this moment, but also intergenerationally, the future generations, then, of course, it's evident, absolutely evident. Hmm? Notice that even short-term advantages for the poorest in consequence of redistributive policies do not necessarily provide real improvement for them. It may be an improvement in current money income tra uh, transfer, hmm? but not necessarily one in respect to their opportunities. If you give people more money, they will not, at that, mo at that moment, that will not... Uh, if they are starving, yes, but then give them food, but that's another question. Real prosperity, wealth, and the enhancement of opportunities are created by a rise in productivity, which is the consequence of both capital accumulation and technological innovation, which go hand in hand. Hmm? You cannot have the one with the other. Edison needed J.P. Morgan. James Watt also needed a capitalist who gave him capital. Stevenson... First, he, had, he invented uh, the locomotive, but he needed also somebody who gave him the money. Hmm? So uh, technical innovation without capital is of no use. And, and capital accumulation makes possible new innovations. Hmm? That, that's the big mistake for, of Piketty's book. He thinks capital accumulation and technical innovation has nothing to do with each other. He, these are two different things for him. It's absolutely crazy, but hmm? he thinks you can have technolo technological innovation without capital accumulation. That's the whole point of his book, hmm? and it's a fundamental error, mistake. Hmm? You know Piketty? Who is Piketty? Yeah. Thomas Piketty, the French economist. So, well, hmm? the book will come out now in October. Hmm? So, um, pardon? In the, uh, Piketty's book in German. In German. Yeah, I know that in America it's already. Uh, Krugman has already praised it hmm? as the big, uh, as, a, as a potential Nobel Prize uh, winner. Hmm? Anyway, where have I been? Um, uh, okay. As Jason Brennan rightly emphasizes, quote, the biggest predictor and cause of increases in worker quality of life is capital accumulation, since this drives up the productivity of labor and labor prices. That's absolutely fundamental. And this is the point of the whole story. People in Pareto superior land will not simply be wealthier in terms of money income. It's not just about money. They will be better off in every respect. They will be more productive. That is, they will have a higher level of skill and education and therefore of opportunities. The society they live in will be technologically more advanced, which also means that more of these goods, which before were luxury goods, available only to members of the top income class, will now be available for mass consumption, including the poorest. It's very important. 
Mass today's mass consumption was luxury goods of the past, and today's luxury goods will be the mass consumption of tomorrow. Hmm? So even if, Porsche for example, so even if because of inevitable capital accumulation, the gap in terms of wealth and money income as reflected in statistics between the richest and the poorest will increase in terms of the real standard of living, including education and opportunities, the gap will simultaneously dramatically decrease. We recognize that exactly this has that exactly this has already happened in the past when we take standards of everyday living, considering household appli appliances, health care, the washing machine, eh, for example, health care, mm, available information, technology, means of transportation, education. If you, if you consider what a washing machine signifies for women's life, everyday life, it has liberated women, mm, hasn't it? Mm? The yeah, whole ha household appliance had changed completely women's life. Hmm? Yeah, it's because of, hmm? Hmm? pardon? <laughs> no, every day is like, every day they are. Huh? <laughs> because by changing men's life, also women's life is changed. Hmm? <laughs> so, uh, healthcare, available information technology, means of transportation, education, etc. And compare the difference between people like, for example, Bill Gates and the present day blue collar worker on one hand, with the difference. On the other hand, between the top rich in the 19th century, say a John Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie, and the normal factory work of that time, hmm, there was the, the bigger gap. Hmm, hmm. That was an incredible gap. Hmm. Not even the richest king in the past enjoyed the standard of living which capitalist growth and its technologically innovative power has provided every single citizen of today's modern societies. Hmm. Louis XIV, I would not like to live at Versailles in the 17th century. Imagine you have to go to the loo, hmm? <laughs> to the toilet. Oh, terrible. Well, anyway. Presupposes the unquestionable efficiency of capitalism and a free market in raising prosperity for all. The real question of social justice, therefore, seems to be the question of the fairness or justice of the initial configuration of the legal and institutional framework, making possible this efficiency and giving everybody without discrimination a fair chance of sharing in its fruits. Afterwards, the market will produce inequalities and distribution outcomes, but they are fair because the initial outset, initial setting is fair. Hmm? Once acknowledged, the, mark, the markets are best in allocating resources efficiently, which Rawls does not deny. And distribu the distribution ruled out as best way of meeting the distributional adequacy condition, which Rawls denies. Hmm? That is the difference principle. We only have to search for the criteria for a fair and just initial legal and institutional framework of a market order with, which guarantees the respect of basic human rights of every single person without discrimination. It is clear that as far as politics and public institution building is concerned, the term social justice can only have a meaning in reference to this framework. And it has nothing to do with distribu distribu distributive justice. Hmm? It's, it is exactly at this point, however, that the perspective of social justice starts to become even wider. Social justice does not merely appeal to institutional configurations and state regulations, and does not only relate to politics and public institution building, but also has to be understood in much a broader way. Basically, it is human beings who are just or are just, unjust. Recall the Ulpian's definition. It's the firma, the constant will to give to everybody his due. Hmm? Which goes to say, social justice too is attributable not only to legal and institutional framework of society, but also even in the first place to freely and intentionally acting human beings, who after all are also the ones responsible for the concrete shaping of the legal and institutional framework. The concept of social justice applied to human actions refers to their quality of bearing upon the overall, overall condition of society, the rights, opportunities, and legitimate needs of its members that is upon the common good. Hmm? Moreover, there is not only the labor market, there also exists a market for social and health services, for education, for insurance against any kind of misfortune which call into play entrepreneurial initiative. Also, or exactly because it is proof, also the market for mutual aid societies, of course, they are also in competition. 
also or exactly because it is proof, uh, it is profit orientated, such entrepreneurial initiative and creativity necessarily aims at satisfying the consumer's determined needs and preferences, otherwise you could not make a profit, hmm? including the consumers of health provisions, education, assurance, old age provision, etc. Otherwise, no profit would result from such entrepreneurial activities. Yet, there may be needs which cannot be satisfied by profit-seeking entrepreneurial activity, of course. So, there remains the wide field of non-profit and voluntary or charity organizations helping to meet determinate needs specifically, specifically, specifically of the poorest, especially of the poorest. A privileged field of exercising social justice as a virtue, united with charity, Christian charity. All of this is part of the realization of social justice in the sense of respecting the dignity of human persons as free and responsible beings. We have this, this good Samaritan, he sees the, the, he sees Samaritan, he sees the poor guy there, and the, he uh, recognizes him uh, a, a fellow human being with the same dignity that he is and he helps him. That's an act of social justice and of charity but also of justice on that level because it's due to him as a human being. Hmm? Hmm? Created so in him, echo. So um, it is social justice which becomes therefore by solidarity. That's true solidarity and it's perfected by charity. Such things are completely overlooked if social justice and human rights are seen only in the context of claims towards the state and the redistributionist policies are called for. Uh, both is harmful for the increase uh, of general prosperity and also morally questionable because based on compulsory taxation and with this on the state's invasion into the property of rights on the, the property rights of exactly those citizens whose contribution to economic growth and thus to general prosperity is by far the largest anyway. Hmm? That's the So they are the richest, but they are though, those who have contributed most to, to economic growth and therefore to enriching the poor. And they are taxed because that's unjust that they're rich, that's absolutely perverse and has no basis in sound economic thinking. Hmm? This has nothing to do so with justice, redistribution, redistribution just to, you know, to, 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 to raise the level of the, of the poor, but can rightly be called unjust confiscation, which is moreover economically harmful, opposed to the common good and, and so to social justice too, because it harms besides the poor in the long run. With this, we have come to a dimension of social justice which is, which is worlds away from current just, uh, social justice talk. It is, however, rather close to a traditional way of understanding social justice in the Catholic tradition. And this would be now the last part, still possible. Hmm? Uh, as in my first talk, now we come to social justice and Catholic social doctrine. Hmm? Um, I think it's interesting, yeah. Hmm? So, mm, as it is well known, mm, the term social justice most probably was first used by the Italian Jesuit and philosopher Luigi Tapparelli d'Azeglio. Mm. For him, I think I yeah, here he is. Mm, for him, social justice was simply justice between man and man, and meant res respecting in every human being i diritti di umanità, the rights of humanity. It's precisely what we have seen, the dignity of being a human being. Mm? This corresponds with what I have attributed in the above scheme to level one, the higher and more fundamental level of human dignity. Moreover, Taparelli d'Azeglio emphasizes that part of social justice is also to respect the natural inequalities between human beings, inequalities such as people's place and role in society as, for example, the difference between a father and a son. We cannot, do, to treat them as equals would be socially unjust. Hmm? Because these differences do not impair those rights which are springing from their being part of the human species. As human beings, they have to be treated equally, but then they have a special role or place in society by nature or by acquisition or by function or whatever, and in that respect they are unequal. Now this, of course, and this also belongs to social justice to respect that, he says. 
He doesn't say much more about social justice. Hmm? Okay. No. Now, this, of course, has nothing to do with our, our contemporary concept of social justice as an alleged kind of distributive justice. It's, 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 it's a pity that Hayek understands it only as distributive justice and then criticizes rightly. But it shows the way the term has been created and afterwards made known by the 19th century Catholic priest and philosopher Antonio Rosmini, hmm? it's the second one I noticed there, in his book, The Constitution and the Social Justice, published in 1848. Uh, it has been published in, in English by the Acton, in, well, not by the, by the Lexington books. Yeah, huh? But Sam Gregg, in, 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 a, in a series edited by Samuel Gregg, I think. Hmm? Uh, you can also buy it as a Kindle book, hmm? the English translation. Only later, the term social justice was assumed by the German school of solidarism founded by the Jesuit economist and social philosopher Heinrich Pesch, in which the drafters of the encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, Gustav Kundlach, and Oswald von Nelbreuning, also Jesuits, have been educated. As the principle of society, so the term social justice was introduced into the common vocabulary by this encyclical. Quadragesimo Anno used it in a peculiar way, saying that com competition was not sufficient as a regulatory principle of the economy. It needed, so the, says the encyclical, to be complemented by social justice and social love. According to Nell Breuning's well-known extensive comment on the encyclical, social justice referred to the state and its task to establish a legal and institutional order on the basis of which the market could operate for the common good. There is no mention of correcting market outcomes by redistribution. Rather, social justice was seen as a supreme regulatory framework established by state authority in view of channeling market competition according to a principle of order can be rightly understood. Hmm? It's certainly a use of the term social justice that could be understood in the sense I have elaborated so far. Hmm? It is interesting that the neoliberal economist like Wilhelm Röpke, ordo liberalist, hmm, praised the view of Quadrismo Anno as exactly corresponding to his own ordo liberal view of the free market economy, <coughs> embedded in a framework of rules assuring it's being not corrupted by monopolies, cartels, etc. Hmm? However, <coughs> Social justice, as mentioned in Quadragesimo Anno, unilaterally refers to the state. That is, according to Neil Breuning, to the idea that the state is ultimately responsible for the good functioning of the market economy. This assumption is based on the idea that the market itself, that is, free competition of the market forces, is not a regulatory principle for its functioning in favor of the common good. Therefore, the idea of social justice, as it appears in Quadramesimo Anno, contains a bias, hmm? at least ambivalent. It easily leads to mentality which, in the end, calls for state intervention in order to correct the market and its outcome in the name of social justice, presupposing that the market has no self-regulatory force or not sufficient and market failure theories as they have been done later called. According to the earlier mentioned old tradition, Social justice essentially is what justice generally is, a moral virtue of human beings, not a measure of just distribution of wealth and income. In this older sense, social justice is identified with what Thomas Aquinas called general justice and later one on was called legal justice. General or legal justice is the justice of individual persons in their actions as far as these actions refer not to the good of a single person, for example, a, in a contract to another party of a contract or a seller or a buyer, but to the common good, to the overall common good of society. In this sense, Antonio Rosmini wrote already in 1837, very interesting quote, public good must be sought in the private citizen, social justice in individual justice. The foundation stone of the social edifice must be virtue buried deep in the human heart. Very nice quotation. The object, the object of the virtue of justice is the due, hmm? which is the use, the right of each person. A capitalist who inverts his wealth 
or part of it in growth producing entrepreneurial activity creating mm -hmm. workplaces or an entrepreneur who seeks to make a profit by satisfying consumer needs thus contributes each of them to technological innovation to increase productivity and in consequence to a rise in real wages as well as general prosperity also for generations to come and so they contribute more to the common good than any state policy redistributing income that furthermore shows slows down economic growth and the rise in general prosperity this in my view is what economics economics teaches and what has to be taken into account when talking about social justice precisely in so far as social justice means the virtue of <coughs> general or legal justice really profit profitable action of capitalists and entrepreneurs on the free market contributes more to social justice to the common good than anything the state can do with the exception of its indispensable task of securing the legal and institutional framework mainly the regime of property rights which is the state's specific and indispensable contribution to the common good social justice as a virtue leads to understanding how important it is in a human society that all citizens feel responsible for the common good that they can't simply delegate their duty of justice and solidarity to the state according to the principle of subsidiarity cherished by catholic social doctrine they even should not delegate it to the state subsidiarity does not mean that the state leaves only we have seen that already less important tasks to society while concentrating on the most important ones it means that the state helps without taking over and assists the lower communities and individuals to fulfill their own task. This is how the principle of, uh, was defined in the encyclical Centesimus Annus, number, number 48. I think that's also a slide, I hope. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. It says, um, um, a community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter of its functions but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. According to Centesimus Annus number 15, then, second quotation, this also applies to the market economy. Quote, indirectly and according to the principle of subsidiarity, the state creates favorable conditions for the free exercise of economic activity, which will lead to abundant opportunities for employment and sources of wealth. This is not redistribution of income to reduce inequality. This, and not redistribution, is the state's fundamental contribution to the common good and to social justice. Now I come to the short conclusion. To conclude, the concept of social justice need not to be entirely rejected or even be attributed to the category of nonsense, as Hayek writes. It is, however, a very insidious term and nowadays mostly used in a vague and emotional way, often detrimental for the common good. But there certainly is what we might call a true meaning of social justice. It derives from the higher or fundamental level of considering human dignity as derived from human nature and the rights springing from that dignity. Taking this into account, we can apply the category of ju justice to the basic legal and institutional framework of a society and regarding the economy of the free market, mainly the rule of law and the regime of property rights, but not to the distributive justi justice. Hmm? It makes sense to talk about social justice considering the fairness of this framework especially with reference to the justice of the persons responsible for the concrete shaping of this framework, which in fact is the basic common good of human society, says Benedict XVI in Caritas in Veritate. As social justice is essentially a moral virtue, it also applies to all other actions of human beings as far as they relate to the common good. Social justice in this sense applies to the actions of capitalists, investors, entrepreneurs, but also in general to citizens that feel responsible for people in need and for the poor, which should be the ways especially, especially for us Christians. Catholic social teaching, it seems to me, still suffers from a prejudice against the socially beneficial nature of freedom. It therefore mistrusts market mechanisms and lays too much confidence on the state as a promoter of the common good, while completely disregarding the terrible dangers of abuses of power and state failures. Being focused too much on moral argument 
and ideal theory like Rolf hmm, doesn't make the calculus. Hmm, it disregards the logic of economic thinking. It still does not sufficiently appreciate that it is precisely the spontaneous order of the market that promotes the common good and with it social justice, provided the initial legal and institutional framework is just. The market, in fact, is much better at this than any attempt of the state and its bureaucracies at trying to shape society according to a pattern of only alleged social justice. Thank you.